In this lesson, we're going to talk about the real number system, and specifically, we're going to learn about classifying numbers within our real number system. So basically, we're going to discuss the definition of the natural numbers, the whole numbers, the integers, the rational numbers, and the irrational numbers. So we're going to start out today by talking about the natural numbers. These are also known as the counting numbers. So I've kind of set this up to where we're going to look at everything in set notation. If you don't know what a set is, essentially a set is just a collection of stuff. So we've named our set. Here we have an N, which just represents the natural numbers. And inside of these curly braces, these are known as set braces. So inside these braces, we just put the elements or members of the set. So what we have is elements or members of the set of natural numbers. We start with the number one. That's the smallest natural number. And then we increase in increments of one indefinitely. So obviously if we're starting with one and we increase by one, we get to two. Then if we do that again, we get to three, then four, then five, so on and so forth. Now, because we can't obviously list all of the natural numbers, because it goes on forever and ever and ever, we put these three dots here, right? The three dots, this is an ellipsis. So it just says that the pattern is going to continue forever. We're going to run into this a lot in our study of mathematics. So again, after four, we come five, then six, then seven, so on and so forth. Now, another thing we can do with our set of numbers here, we can draw a visual representation of the set of natural numbers. So this right here is a horizontal number line. So we're going to encounter a lot of different number lines throughout our study of mathematics. This is probably the simplest one you're going to work with, just a horizontal number line. You'll see at the left most point here, we have a notch here, which represents the smallest natural number, which is one. As we move to the right, we have additional notches that represent a distance of one unit more or an increase of one. So in other words, if I move to the right from one, I get to two, then three, then four, then five, you know, so on and so forth. So this is another important concept in math. As we move to the right, our numbers are increasing. As we move to the left, our numbers are decreasing. So this is just a way to visually represent this set. And I just want to call your attention to one last thing here. You don't have an arrow on the left because the smallest natural number is listed. You have an arrow on the right because we don't list the largest natural number because there is none. Right? It's an infinite set. It just continues forever and ever and ever. If I thought about the largest natural number I could, let's say it's just one trillion, well, I can just add one of that, one trillion and one. So there is no largest natural number. So that's why we have that arrow there. And that's why we have the ellipsis here. All right, now let's talk about the whole numbers. So the whole numbers essentially are just the natural numbers with the inclusion of the number zero. So this allows us to count nothing, right? So we have W here as the set name, and then the set contains the elements 0, 1, 2, 3. And then again, we have the ellipsis here to show that, hey, this pattern is going to continue forever. Now, again, we have a number line that shows this. Our smallest number is now 0. It's not 1. And again, there's no arrow on the left because we have the smallest number. And this continues forever in the right direction, right, because numbers increase moving to the right. So again, we have our arrow here on the right because there will be no largest whole number. So one more thing I want to bring your attention to, you can see that the number line for the whole numbers and the number line for the natural numbers are basically identical with the exception of having a zero. So this tells us that the natural numbers are all whole numbers, but the whole numbers are not all natural numbers. So in other words, if you've talked about sets before, you'll understand this as the natural numbers are a subset of the whole numbers, meaning every natural number can be thought of as a whole number, but it's not the same vice versa, right? Not every whole number, meaning zero, can be thought of as a natural number. So next we want to think about the integers. So in our everyday life, we want to be able to think about negative values. So suppose you have $20 in your bank account, and you take your debit card and you go out and you spend 30. Well, now your bank balance is going to be negative 10. It'll actually be a little bit less than that because your bank's probably going to charge you, you know, some sort of fee for going overdraft. But if it wasn't an overdraft fee, let's just say your bank balance is negative $10 now. The integers allow us to count negative values like that. 
It also would allow us to think about negative temperatures or you know, going below sea level. There's all kinds of applications for the set of numbers known as the integers. So we're gonna call our set Z, and we have an ellipsis here and here, which tells us that I'm gonna kinda of start in the middle at zero here. If I decrease by one, I'm gonna to go to negative one, then negative two, then negative three. So after negative three, I'd have negative four, then negative five, then negative six. So this guy right here is telling me I'm decreasing by one indefinitely. Over on the right, if I start from zero again and I go to the right, well, I'm increasing by one. So I'm going to one, then two, then three, then four, you know, so on and so forth. Now, when I think about the integers, again, all of the whole numbers, so all of the sets that I've worked with before, the smaller sets, so the whole numbers is gonna be a smaller set than the integers, right? Because they don't have any negative numbers. And then the natural numbers are gonna be a smaller set than the whole numbers because it doesn't have zero. So every time I kind of work myself backwards, I can say, okay, well, every integer is not gonna be a whole number, but every whole number is gonna be an integer. And every natural number is gonna be an integer, right? If I look at the integers, I can see that I have one, two, three, and then you know I have that same pattern. So I have my natural numbers there. Or I can say, okay, well, I have zero, one, two, three, and then again, my ellipsis, I have my whole numbers there. So every natural number is an integer, and every whole number is an integer, but not every integer is a whole number or a natural number. All right, so we can, again, visually represent this set using a number line. If we look at our number line here, it's drawn a little bit differently. You'll see you have an arrow at the left and an arrow at the right. That's because there is no smallest integer and there is no largest integer. So we have numbers continuing in both directions forever. You can kind of think about the center point of this as zero. If I move to the right, I'm increasing, right? So I go by one. So I go to one, then two, then three, then four, you know, so on and so forth. If I start at zero and I go to the left, well, I'm decreasing by one. So I go to negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six. Again, so on and so forth. Now let's think about the rational numbers. So for this guy, we've written it in what's known as set builder notation. In case you're unfamiliar with this notation, I'll walk you through it, it's pretty easy. So we have a capital letter Q that represents the rational numbers. And I'm just gonna read this and then I'll explain it. So it's the set of all elements P over Q such that P and Q are elements of Z. So this set Z we talked about above, this is the set of integers. And we have another condition that Q is not equal to zero. So for set builder notation, it always starts out by saying the set of all elements and then whatever this is. So in this case, it's lowercase p over lowercase q. And let me make that p to where it looks a little more lowercase. And then we have this vertical bar here. This means such that. So this is where we're going to list a condition. So this right here is the condition. So this is the condition. And our condition is that p is an element of the set z Q is an element of the set Z. So in other words, P and Q are both integers. And then the last condition is that Q, because it's in the denominator of this fraction, is not gonna be equal to zero because again, we cannot divide by zero. So P and Q are integers and Q is not equal to zero. Now, we can take any integer we want and write it as a rational number. So again, as we move up, we think about the numbers that were covered before they're a smaller set, so we can take every integer and write it as a rational number. We can take every whole number and write it as a rational number. We can take every natural number and write it as a rational number. All right, so what I'm going to say here is that every integer is a rational number, every whole number is a rational number, and every natural number is a rational number, but not every rational number is an integer, not every rational number is a whole number, not every rational number is a natural number. And you can think about how you could take an integer like let's just say the number six. How could I write this as a rational number? Well, from the definition, it's the numerator and denominator of this guy have to be integers. Well, I can take any integer I want and just write it over the number one. So six over one is the same thing as six, right? So this is how I would write an integer or a whole number or a natural number as a rational number. So let's think about some rational numbers that are not integers. So one would be something like you have an integer four over an integer five, right? So this fits the definition we have up here. We have an integer four over an integer five. This is not an integer. This is not a whole number. This is not a natural number. If I do the division here and write this in decimal form, this is going to be 0 0.8. Now, 
This is an important point about rational numbers. Rational numbers in decimal form will either terminate, like this one terminated, there's nothing after the eight, or it will repeat the same pattern of digits forever, okay? So a good example of this, let's say I had two ninths. So two ninths. And we all know how to do basic division, right? If I divide two by nine, I know I'm gonna put a decimal point there, bring this up here, put a zero here so I can do my division. Nine would go into 20 twice. So put a two here, two times nine is 18. Subtract and I would get two. So to continue this division, I would put a zero here and bring this down and I would have 20 again. Well, I started out with that. So let's do this again. So nine goes into 20 how many times? Twice, two times nine is 18, subtract and I get two. Put a zero, bring this down, I got 20 again. So you can see that this would continue forever and ever and ever. So in other words, this would be 0.222222. I could put as many twos as I'd like. So to represent this concept, what we'll do is we'll put a bar over the two to say that it continues forever. Or another thing you can do, we can use the ellipsis here, but we've got to make it completely crystal clear. I'm going to put 0 0.222. So it's crystal clear that that two is going to continue forever and then put my three dots there. So that's two different ways you can kind of notate a repeating decimal. But the important thing here is to understand that if you have a rational number in decimal form, it's either going to repeat the same pattern forever or it's going to terminate. So now let's talk about the irrational numbers. So the irrational numbers are basically real numbers that are not rational numbers. So we have this listed as P, okay? So P is standing for the irrational numbers. And again, I have it in set builder notation. So the set of all elements X. So in other words, any real number that you can think of such that X is real, but not rational. So in the real number system, any real number that's not rational is by definition irrational. So even if you've never heard of an irrational number before, you've probably heard of pi, right? It's very famous. It's the ratio in geometry of a circle's circumference to its diameter, right? So the symbol for it looks like this. And basically it's approximately 3.14. But after that four, they have an infinite number of digits that continues and there's no pattern to it, okay? So it just continues forever and ever and ever. And you can list as many digits of pi as you want, you'll never finish, right? Another one that's pretty famous is the number E. And E is used in a lot of applications. We'll see it later on in this course. And it deals with problems that involve growth, decay, things like that. You might also see something like the square root of two. This is something you can punch in on your calculator right now. And your calculator, depending on how it works, will give you a series of digits. It's gonna go 1.41. And then after the one, it's gonna give you some digits, but at some point it's gonna stop. It's either gonna truncate, meaning it's just gonna cut it off, or it's gonna do some type of rounding procedure. But there is no exact decimal answer that you can give for the square root of two, because again, the decimal continues forever and ever and ever without a pattern. So these are three examples of irrational numbers. All right, so then for the real numbers, a real number is any number that is either rational or irrational. So if we look at the number line we use for the integers here, it doesn't have to just represent the integers. This can represent the set of all real numbers. Although our notches are in increments of one, I can go in here and put a notch anywhere I want. So between zero and one, I can put a notch there for the number one half, right? That's a rational number. And I could put a notch there somewhere for the square root of two. Let's just say that's about right here. I don't know exactly where it would be, but let's just say this is the square root of two. So with the real numbers, you can basically say that it represents a point on the number line where the number line is just all the real numbers together. And when we think about an official definition for the real numbers, basically a real number is any number that is either rational, which means again, we can write it as the quotient of two integers where the denominator is not zero, or it's irrational, right? It's something like pi or e or square root of two or square root of five, something like that. So the set of all x such that x is an element of the set of q, which we said were the rational numbers, 
where x is an element of the set p, which we said were the irrational numbers. So we have a little diagram here to hopefully make this clear for you. This can be helpful to understand that no rational number can be an irrational number also. So you're either an irrational number or you're a rational number. You can't be both. If we're thinking about this in terms of sets, these two sets, the irrational numbers and the rational numbers, are disjoint, right? They have no elements in common. So irrational numbers, we know already this is something like pi or e or square root of 2 or square root of 5. But with the rational numbers, we can think about this if I start at kind of the smallest set here. Well, for the natural numbers, I know this could be something like the number 1 or 2 or something like that. Well, this is also a whole number. It's also an integer, and it's also a rational number. Okay, so we kind of work our way up. With whole numbers, we just take the natural numbers and we include 0. So you could say 0, 1, 2, you know, with integers, we have all the whole numbers, but we also have the negatives of those. So you could say, you know, negative 1, 0, 1, you know, something like that. And then with the rational numbers, we have all the integers, all the whole numbers, all the natural numbers. We just include all the, you know, quotients that we can make with two integers. So we would have our 4 fifths, we would have our 2 ninths, we would have our negative 1 eighth, you know, so on and so forth. So let's wrap up our lesson by just looking at a quick sample problem. So we have set A, which is equal to, we have the elements, which are negative 3, 14, negative 1 seventh, 0, square root of 5, and 2 ninths. So what elements of set A are natural numbers? So we know the set of natural numbers starts with 1, increases by 1 indefinitely. So we know negative 3 is not, right, because it's less than 1. 14 would be. Negative 1 seventh is not. 0 is not, because that's a whole number. Square root of 5 is not, and 2 ninths is not. So what elements of set A are natural numbers? Just 14. All right, so same set. Now we're asking what elements of set A are whole numbers. So again, we know all natural numbers are whole numbers. So we know 14 would go in there. And we also know 0 is a whole number, so that would be in there as well. So we would have 0 and 14 only. All right, so what elements of set A are integers? Again, I'm going to always list what was listed before. So whole numbers, we had 0 and 14. And now we want to think about negative whole numbers. So basically, any whole number with a negative sign in front of it. So we have negative 3 that we can add to this list. So we would put negative 3 over here. So we have negative 3, 0, and 14. All right, so what elements of set A are rational numbers? So again, I'm going to take what I just listed. So I have negative 3, 0, and 14. These can all be written as rational numbers because I could put them each over 1. So we would be good there. So what else do we have in here now? So I can kind of not think about this or this or this because they're already listed. Negative 1 over 7, is that the quotient of two integers with a non-zero denominator? Yes, it is. So I can kind of throw that in there. And that's gone. What about 2 ninths? Well, yeah, I can throw that in there as well. That's the quotient of two integers with a non-zero denominator. What about the square root of 5? If you think about the square root of 5, this is an irrational number. And one way you can tell is just punching that up on a calculator. You're going to get a nasty, nasty decimal with no pattern that is going to continue forever or anything like that. It's just a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal. So we know this is an irrational number. So for the rational numbers, we have negative 1 7th, negative 3, 0, 14, and 2 ninths. And then lastly, what elements of set A are irrational numbers? We just have the square root of 5.